Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bello, and today I've got Rachel Afonso on the show. Rachel, welcome. Oh, my gosh, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. It's so great to have you here. And we're going to dive into a product that you're working on and that you're, you're working on launching currently. But before we get to that real quick, I wanted to give a shout out to my friends over at Switchgear Marketing. And they do web design, marketing, advertising, and consulting. And they're actually helping me out with you know, reaching out, getting guests on my show, getting me on other shows. And um, it's been really helpful so far. I think I'm like, whoa, slow down. They're helping me so fast that I'm like, I don't think I have all the time to do all of these interviews, but this is really exciting. And I'm glad that uh, they connected us too as well. So uh, for anyone who's looking for any of those services, feel free to reach out to my friends over there. Again, that's Switch Gear Marketing. And you can go to switchgearmarketing.com to check them out. I'll drop that in the show notes for you. But Rachel, Great to have you. Welcome once again. I want to give you a second just to introduce yourself. Like, who are you? What are your favorite hobbies? You know, like, what's an interesting fact? And then tell us more about what you're working on. All right. So my name is Rachel. I'm 24 years old. I live in sunny South Florida. Probably my biggest hobby slash interest, and you'll even see it in the book, is cars. I've been a car for oh my gosh, six, seven years now doing everything from promotion to racing to mechanic to modeling, like just everything and anything in the world that a female could get involved with and then some. And it translates over into the product that I'm bringing to life now. That's awesome. And I took one look at your Instagram and I was like, I think she likes cars. (laughs) No, so it made sense to see like the nice exotic car pictures and then, you know, your product is about cars. And so that's super cool that you're actually passionate about it. And how long have you been doing that? Your whole life, you said? Like as long as you can remember? Go-karting yeah. when you're little, maybe? Things like that? My biggest, my first car story, I guess, is uh, my dad took me when I was six years old to a like local car show. And awesome. my dad was super into like the big like muscle cars, like the old Chevelle. Rods, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so we were out there checking them out and everyone's like walking around and then all of a sudden like everybody stops and they all start to move out of the way. And my dad's like pulling me, he's like, move, move, move. And I turn around and there's this beautiful, and now I know what it is, but it was a Lamborghini Countach with doors up and yeah. everything. I was just showboating through and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I want to be like that guy. I need to get involved with what that guy does. So yeah. from like six years old, it was all about cars. My little brother and I would play Hot Wheels, GTA, probably not the best influence on that, but you know, he, he turned <laughs> out all right. So <laughs> that's good. That's so funny. I mean, because my girlfriend's actually really into cars too. She was a service advisor at like BMW and Mercedes before and Lexus. So she knows more about cars than I do. She's like, oh, here's your such and such filter. And I'm like, there's a filter in the glove box, right? Like, I don't know these things. I, I really do love and appreciate cars, but I wish I knew more about them because I'm the guy who gets ripped off when I when they tell me I knew, I need new tires and I don't really know. And I'm like, okay, I guess I need new tires. <laughs> my girlfriend's like, you do not need new tires. So I call her and I'm sure like your friends call you like, Hey, do I really need all these services? My mechanics telling me I need a through Z. I really only need, you know, a and B, right. Super helpful information and knowledge to have. And so how do you spend your days and time currently? Is this what you're working on full time? Like, are you pursuing your passion full time or are you kind of doing something on the side and building this? I always like to hear the entrepreneurial story because a lot of us have multiple side hustles while we try to figure things out. Right. Oh, yeah. Right now, I actually work as the director of operations for a company called Exotic Car Hacks, which teaches people how to hack their way into exotic cars. Um, It's a very interesting program to be a part of. It's actually helped me as a 24-year-old. I'm not in necessarily anything super exotic, but I just got myself a uh, C300 Mercedes. And I did it using their principles, their teaching and everything like that. And I've been doing that now for about four years. And then we came up with this idea to bring this product to life. So I was fortunate enough to have the company I work for help and endorse this product with me. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. It's like a combined effort. So not only like I'm the author, but they're the ones like publishing it, bringing it to life, helping me with marketing and everything like that. And just the whole team that I work with is so incredible. I could have not have done this without them. That's super cool. And I've actually, I've seen uh, exotic car hacks. I mean, I'm in secret Academy on Facebook and everything. So I know there's a lot of the probably mutual friends that we have. 
And I have a friend who's like total ECH move. He bought some cool car and then he upgraded it. He did something. I was like, wait, what's ECH? And he said exotic car hacks. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember now. And again, I hadn't done the course, but I know that the principles that you guys learn, he, he got a cool car, like a nice BMW and then kept it for a couple months, sold it and profited on it and then got like a truck. So he was just trading in things, kind of like how people do watches, right? That's another course that uh, PJ offers, right? Uh, watch Conspiracy, I believe. Watch Trading Academy, we, like rebranded it. Has okay, name. okay, because Conspiracy people were like, oh, <laughs> what's it called now? I like that name. Watch Trading Academy. Watch Trading Academy. Okay, it's a little more like, okay, no fancy trading. Well, and no, so there's there's things that you can do with that. And if anyone's flipped stuff at garage sales or anything, I mean, it's just basically arbitrage. Like you're finding something, you're getting it at a lower value, and then you trade up, and then you can swap things out. And so that's super cool though, that you have the support of that company behind you because figuring it all out on your own can be challenging. And I looked at your site, you know, everything looks good. You got a countdown timer. The product looks awesome. Like the graphics are great. And so I was like very impressed. I still am impressed. It's not like I'm not impressed, but I'm like, you guys have a team behind it. It's not just you alone. Right. Cause that's, that's a lot. <laughs> that was the never in my life did I think I was going to be an entrepreneur. I never took like business classes in high school. I never <laughs> that said like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur when I grow up, I'm going to own my own business and right. that was me. And then I started working for exotic car hacks and with PJ and the team and slowly, but surely I was like, you know what? Now I get why this lifestyle is so appealing and mm. the traits that make entrepreneurs entrepreneurs. And exactly. You know, you got to go for it. You got to just put all your eggs in that basket as scary as it sounds, but you know, believing in yourself at the end of the day is so important, but I'm lucky enough to also have a great support network. And I know that's very, very helpful to everything that I've been able to accomplish so far. And what you said too, cause I mean, I went, you know, I went to college and I studied business school and I never really made the connection until now it makes so much sense. I listen to podcasts and stuff and they're like, it made no sense that your business teacher like drove a little Corolla to school, you know, like they're not making a lot of money. You know, they're teaching you stuff like marketing. I had a friend who was doing Facebook ads in 2012 and then the teacher would be talking about like billboards, you know, the marketing class. It just, it was so outdated and you being able to work with, you know, successful entrepreneurs and watching their business grow. That's the best mentor because you're getting paid to like in a, in a role to learn from, successful people. And that's like the best. And, you know, I did that in real estate too. I worked with two business owners in, in Houston and that's how I got my foot in the door of real estate. They're both like in their, you know, mid thirties, having really cool lifestyle businesses, like going on vacation for a month. I'm like, what? Heck, how do you do this? And in corporate America, like you get 10 days a year, maybe until, unless you've been there for five years. Right. And then you get an extra week, like big deal. So you, you're probably learning so much from them and then the network that that exposes you to, right? You get to travel, I'm sure. Well, COVID, we're, we're kind of holding off on a little bit of the traveling, but what's been your biggest breakthrough in the last few years? Like what was your biggest Eureka moment? That if you try hard enough and you put all your effort into something, no matter how many times you may think you fail or how many difficulties you're met with, eventually you're going to get exactly what you want. Yes. And Love it may that. not be in the time span that you think it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. So you just have to keep striving and pushing and pushing. And even though you're tired, you've got to get up that next morning. You've got to get back to the grind. You've got to do what you got to do because nobody <laughs> else is going to do it for you. And you don't want anyone else to have your success because it's yours. You earned it. Yeah. And it, it means so much more when you accomplish something. Like when I, you know, when I worked in oil and gas, for example, sure, it was a, it was a cool job. People are like, whoa, you know, you got that job. That, it was my dream job. And then three years later, I was like, this, this is terrible. I'm, I need to get out of here, right? And when you earn your first dollar, I mean, I remember my first dollar in real estate. I, I feel like I worked 100 hours to get like that first $500 commission. I was like, man, this is like 10 cents an hour or something. Yeah. But I valued it more than when I was just getting that paycheck every two weeks, you know, and I didn't have to fight for it or work for it. So it means a lot more to you when you go all in on it. And that's a huge takeaway that I had as well is that if you just keep showing up and that can be hard, right? If you, if you fail at something 10 times and people are like, how's that thing going? You know, like not really that great, you know, 
So how do you keep going? I know you have a good support network, but do you have any advice for the audience on how you keep showing up and, you know, when you keep failing or struggling and you get a little closer, like how do you just keep yourself motivated? I have to say it's, there's always been a sense of uh, self accountability on my end. I Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up with a single dad and a younger brother and my dad just worked. No, I I want to say hours a week. And I mean it when I say it. So it was, nobody's going to do it unless I do it. And I guess that's carried on in my adult life too. So I, wake up in the morning sometimes and I'm like, you know what? I really don't want to get out of bed this morning. I just want to stay here, you know, and, and as an nope, entrepreneur, come on, let's go. <laughs> like, I can do it. I can just lay here. You know, the only person I'm hurting is me, but yeah. that's the kicker. You're hurting yourself by not going and keeping up because at the end of the day, you may have a boss, you may have investors, you may have all these things, but the only person that you really have to answer to is the person in the mirror. And that's the last person in the world that I want to let down because I'm stuck with her. So <laughs> that's so true. And then it, it's kind of like even like dieting in a way where no one will really know if you ate 10 cookies right before bed, but you know, right. You're, you like, yep. man, no one saw that, but deep down, you know that you didn't accomplish your goals or you cheated on your goals or whatever. And so that's the biggest thing. You don't want to let yourself down because if you can't trust yourself, I've said this before in other episodes, if you're not able to trust yourself and you can't hold yourself accountable, then, you know, others are, you're going to let others down. You can't even keep the promises you make to yourself, right? So anytime you set a goal at that point, you kind of are like, well, it's not going to happen because I never follow through. And so I think that's extremely important. Starts and ends with you. You're your own alpha and omega. I love that. And that's awesome that you had, you know, such a great example, your dad just working so hard because I mean, I, I think I heard this recently is like, um, tough times or no men or women, you know, I think the saying says men, but tough times, create tough men, tough men, create good times, good times, create weak men, weak men, create tough times, tough. I'm messing it up, but basically good though. Like the, yeah, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like I'm rapping or something, (laughs) but basically I think about this where, you know, you become successful or people become rich and then you drive through those neighborhoods and a lot of those little kids are spoiled. They've got everything. They don't know about work ethic. They they have a nanny. They don't have to clean anything. Then that kind of creates kind of weak people in a way where they're a little entitled sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that is my biggest fear. I'm not quite where I want to be yet, but I know when I'm there, I want to make my kids work for their first car. Even if I have a billion dollars in the bank, like, sorry, You got to drive this beater car that you paid for working minimum wage because you need to understand work ethic, right? And so I think you kind of got that from your dad. I got that from my parents and a lot of my friends who kind of had the silver spoon in their mouth. They struggle a little bit because they never had to work for it, right? They never had to go and bag groceries at a grocery store and like push carts in the summer. They kind of like worked at the family business and just sat at the front desk and- Odd jobs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shudder to think. (laughs) So how much time have you spent on your product and like on creating it? What was the process? Because I I had a product that I worked on creating and I kind of pivoted to real estate. Don't like talking about that. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) It was one of my failures that I'm like, it's not really a failure. It's just I'm not focusing on it right now. But I know how much time went into it, right? So what was your process? Where did you start? Did you kind of start with the idea and just jot things down on a whiteboard or? I, so the whole idea was my, my team has become like family to me. And one of them got married back in 2019 and they got married in Italy. And so we went and we went to the wedding and while I was over there, it was my first time abroad ever. So I was completely immersed and I'm a huge history nerd. So I'm walking around. All the history. Exactly. I'm, I'm enjoying Italy's a good first place to go. Oh my gosh. I, I will go back. I did not get enough in, but, um, when I was looking around and I was walking around cause I refused to take taxis. I'm like, I'm walking everywhere. I want to see it. I want to feel yeah. it. I was shocked at the amount of like bizarre cars that they, that there <laughs> are. And as like an American that's never left America, I'm like, what are these like weird brands? Like, like never- random small cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, these things are weird. And then like ever so often you'll see like a Porsche Cayenne or like a Mercedes S class. And it's like, okay, I know that. But yeah. I started thinking, I was like, this is really weird. And I, you know, I feel so small minded that I didn't even know that these kind of things existed. existed. In the world. Something right. so small, but I was like, you know what, what if I 
could make something. And I, also, I love kids. I've worked with kids my entire life. Before I did all this sort of stuff, I was a nanny. I was a, uh, like a preschool teacher. I did okay. daycares. So yeah. I have a background in education too. So um, I was like, what if I could make a really cool, like a cool book for kids that teaches them about cars, which is what I'm passionate about. And yeah. when I was a kid, I wish there was something like this. Time yeah, time. there's nothing. I can't think of anything like that other than like the movie Cars, but that's yeah. not really the same. <laughs> no. So I was like, you know what? Like, let me make a book. And initially it was going to be, I brought the idea to my ECH team. I was like, listen, guys, I think we could actually do something and working with them for so long because, you know, they're intermingled with Secret Entourage. Like I was always kind of like, when am I going to have that moment? When am when I going to When am I going to have a product, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I brought it to them and I was like, we kind of went through trial and error. Initially, I wanted it to have cars speak their language and teach kids kind of like, you know, what a Ferrari says in Italian. But then I realized that a lot of cool car makes and models aren't all that ethnic. Like only certain ones would speak a different language. Like maybe a Nissan would speak Japanese and then like Kia Korean and things like mm -hmm. that. So I was like, that's not going to work. I was like, but what if, we teach kids what cars say. And I presented it to my team and I, I brought like a, you know, that wheel that would teach you is like you spin it and it lands on the cow and it's like the cow says. <laughs> so That's cool. I brought them something like that. And I was like, and we use this to teach kids all about cars of all shapes and sizes, not just exotics, which is what, you know, we're familiar with. I was like, but let's teach them about, Hondas, let's teach them about Jeeps. Let's teach them about the cars that they see every single day and let's work it up to the cars that they dream about. And it creates this passion and emotion in a child to see like what you go from to what you can get. And then yes. in between it all, every car has a sound with it and then it has a rhyme. And in that rhyme, there are at least two to three educational facts on that car. So a child is still learning while they're playing with the book. Yeah. So like would, would a fact, I'm just guessing like, you know, Jeep, this Jeep is four wheel drive. It can go off road, like that kind of thing. I'm not sure. You want me to read you a rhyme? I can read you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. If you could read me a couple of excerpts, that would be awesome. Cause I'm just trying to think and I can't, I can't. That's, uh, it's hard to put yourself in that mindset, right? Like whenever I talk to a two year old, I'm like, wait, they're two, you know, I gotta, what do I, how do I talk to a two year old? Right. Exactly. It's like, Hmm. Well, and then this is also too, uh, you know, it's a little bit advanced. We say it's for like kids from like three to 12, but also we want the whole point of it is like the higher diction and the vocabulary that's in the book. It's meant to teach kids and remind parents. So parents can sit there and read it with the kids and be like, Oh my gosh. Like I remember my first Honda Civic, like right, I remember right. my Mustang, like I remember these things. Yeah. Their first car that they bought and now they're wherever they're at and exactly that's so, cool yeah read me a couple of rhymes <laughs> all right let's go for the audience a couple of rhymes yes okay all right so there's also i should read uh part of it because there is a little message from me it says this book isn't just for reading it comes with a little game when you flip to the cars page you have to guess the name don't worry it's not that hard to do but if you get stuck just use the rhymes for clues oh that's nice that's cool. Then, I, I miss books like this that rhyme. It's like, you know, adult books don't rhyme. It's nope. those were the days. Yeah, not as fun. I missed So the first stuff. page is like a letter from or a letter from you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just awesome. teaching kids about cars and like why they matter and why they should love cars, you know. Yeah. Okay, so here's one. It says, I am a blank, famous in Japan. You can see me out at the grocery store or at a race with all of my loyal fans. They nicknamed me Godzilla, the monster of the streets. That's because when I go to race, I cannot be beat. That's cool. GTR, right? GTR, Nissan GTR, exactly. Nice. And then they're all kind of, they all have like beautiful artwork. I know it's a podcast. If you know, yeah. Hey, I, I put the video on YouTube if you want to like show what it looks ah. like. Because I, I saw, and for those watching on YouTube, oh, that's awesome. The artwork looks really good. And I saw that on the website. Whoa, that's super cool. <laughs> Man, that's like the coolest kid's book. I wish I had that when I was a kid. Right? Like, that's what I keep saying. I'm like, I really wish I had this as a kid. It would have... You know, a lot of entrepreneurs do stuff like that, though. They're like, I'm creating that thing that I wish I had. You're filling that need. And the only thing, I guess, that can be challenging is like, sometimes, you know, you might create something that you liked without the validation. It's like, are other people going to like it? How do you test it? But I mean, I think that, I mean, I know that probably is going to do really well because people love cars. 
kids love cars. And that, I mean, the graphics for those watching on YouTube, like it looks really nice. It's not like a corny looking cartoon, you know, it's almost like a, a video game type graphic thing. So there was, uh, the best thing I probably ever heard as a kid. And it's funny because it's a kid's movie, but I always reference it is the, it's like an underrated movie. It's called robots. And robots. I don't know if robots. I've seen it. And it's, it's all about like the, the hiddenness. If you're an adult watching it, it's about entrepreneurship and like helping others with your business and becoming good at something so you can help the masses. And right. the main guy who's like the big one that everyone looks up to, he teaches kids on a TV show. And the thing that he always tells them is you look around for a need and then you start coming up with ideas to fill that need. You see a need, you fill a need. And that's what I did. That's so cool. And that's actually a pro tip for everyone who's listening. You know, a lot of people grow up and they're like, oh, I'm not going to watch like kids movies or Disney movies. And then you go, like if you go back and watch those movies like Shrek and stuff, and there's always lessons and then like a bad guy and how, you know, you can learn stuff as an adult that as a kid you didn't really see. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking of like The Lion King and, you know, Aladdin, all those old movies, you kind of watch them and you're like, whoa, I thought this wasn't going to be cool because I'm not a kid anymore, but it's actually like um, you feel the emotions and it also has that nostalgic feeling, but there's always a lesson and you're like, okay, yeah, the bad guy, there's a conflict, there's a resolution, and then there's a lesson as well to learn. So that's cool. So you see a need, feel a need. See a need. That's entrepreneurship. Exactly. And I was watching that movie as an eight year old and I'm like, it's just funny because they're robots and they're just living in this robot world. And then as an adult, I'm like, wait a second. (laughs) This guy's on to (laughs) something. Like I should have paid more attention as an eight year old. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's good because I don't know about you. My, my girlfriend says that she could remember stuff from when she was like four. I'm like, I don't remember anything before I was in second grade. Like, I think I remember making slime in science class, but like, I honestly don't remember stuff from when I was a kid. Do you have like a really good memory from when you were little or? Yeah, I get called an elephant all the time by the people in the office because I just, I remember everything. I, I think my earliest memory is right around like what your girlfriend said, like about four, like four? Or five years I, old. Man, I don't know. Maybe if I saw like a video or something, you know, of me doing something, I might be like, I think I kind of remember that. But for some reason, I just don't. And I have friends who are like me who are like, I don't remember anything. And I have others like you and my girlfriend who are like, I remember everything. Yeah, like an elephant memory. But I think what's crazy is that so much of what, who we are and what we learn apparently is formed when we're kids. And that's what scares me is like, I don't remember anything yet. Those were the most formative years. Like when you're two or three years old, whatever you see around you, whatever you absorb, the the TV that you watch, the things that your parents say that kind of shapes and molds you to some extent because Mm -hmm. that's how your beliefs are formed. So I think it's really cool that you're, when you're impacting kids and you're teaching lessons like that, even though they may be like me one day and not remember any of that really like, it's subconsciously making them a better person and yep. pushing them towards that path that they need mm-hmm. to go down. That's what we want. We want kids with passion. We want kids with drive. We want kids that want to do better and be better, especially growing up in this generation, this world you yeah. want, especially now because entrepreneurship is so normalized. Like it used to be such a everybody. Hush-hush. Yeah. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur now and everyone and their mother. And I just, there's certain things that, you know, like trigger all of us. Like there's, some people that I've met on this journey that could care less whether they're in a Bugatti or in a Corolla, like they don't care about cars, but they love is houses. So it's like, yes, all right, like yes. great, like you, that is motivation. And what I wanted to do with this book too, because like there's, I, there's everything from a Honda Civic to a Pagani in here. So I wanted to show kids, I'm like, listen, like this, these are the kind of things that you can have when you work hard. This mm-hmm. is what you need to do. And there's a couple of rhymes in there that speak about working hard to get this car because that's what it takes. It takes hard work. And there's part of it in at least my generation. I feel like a lot of us are expected things. We're expected the world to cater to us in one way or another, whether it's a job or a relationship or things like that. And I know that I don't want to see another generation that just walks around with their hands out, like, gimme, gimme, gimme. I, I want to see people work hard and strive for the things that they want. And so if I can show kids like cool cars and be like, Hey, listen, yeah, this thing costs $3 million. So it could work. <laughs> Better start working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a super powerful message. And yeah, I get it. Cause you know, we kind of are the, the entitled generation or whatever, like kids these days. I mean, 
are handed a lot of things and I get it. I mean, I had the expectations, like I went to a good private school, high school, and I thought that meant I deserved A's on everything. And then I got to college and I realized like, like what, this person went to that school that I thought was a bad school and they got a better grade than me. Like, shouldn't I be smarter than them and not have to study as much? And that was kind of like my first eye opener. I think like, I don't mind sharing it. I, w- I would always share people. I'm pretty sure I got like a 35 on one of my tests, like out of a hundred, like it was not good. And I dropped that class. Um, economics like 202 or something as a freshman I signed up for a sophomore class as a freshman and I did not prepare try to study the night before like you do in high school you know that worked it did not work and uh yeah but the entitlement and expecting that you deserve something and then even graduating from school or getting a certain job and and thinking that you're going to get six figures right off the gate it's like it ain't gonna happen you got to add value first right and so the lessons that you're going to be teaching like more of us need to know that because I, now I'm learning, but there are kids still coming up, like thinking they deserve X amount of salary out of school or they need a raise because they've done a good job for three months. You know, it's, that's not how the world works. No, it's not. And you know, like I'll reference my dad again. I'm very happy that he brought me up the way I did. Um, I started working at 14 and I haven't stopped since I worked like that string of odd jobs of just like, I don't know what I can do. So I'm going to do something, make money. Yeah, exactly. And it was all to, you know, help towards the household. Cause it was just us. It was, you know, and my poor dad, everything happened in like, Oh eight. And now as an adult, I'm like, Oh my God, I can't imagine going through all that. Like with I know. The world. So I was like me working. I was like, this is fun. This is great. Like I'm, you know, taking care of myself, but for my dad, it was like, okay, perfect. Like she is okay. So let's right. move on to the younger mouth to feed, which was like my seven-year-old brother at the time. So, and yeah. now he is my, you know, younger brother. He's 19 right now okay. and he works two jobs. He <laughs> strives for more and he pushes and he gets the things he wants. And he like just bought himself his first car ever, which was like, that's a, awesome. Yeah. Like he bought himself like a Dodge charger. Cause he was kind of like, out. he's not into cars like me, but he's like, Rachel likes these kind of cars and I'm, like, I'm so proud of it. And he, and you see it and it's like, he never, my dad never gave us like our first car. It was always like, if you raise half, I'll meet you. Like I'll, I'll help you out. Like I'll help. If you take care of your car, I'll pay your insurance. If you do this, I'll do that. It was right. a helping hand. But if I didn't have the cash, I didn't get what I wanted. So I had to go to work and my brother was taught the exact same thing, which I'm proud of him for instilling that into him too, even though, you know, he had it a little bit easier with, you know, me and dad working at the same time. But yeah, that's a really good lesson. And I mean, just you value it a lot more when you work for it. And I mean, my parents are awesome. They're super overly nice. And, you know, they bought me my first car. I, I should have worked for it. I kind of like gave them a little bit of money, but like I wasn't making that much money And I I mean, I got like a V6 Mustang in like 07 or something. And it was cool. Like I got a manual transmission, but I did burnouts at every stop sign. Like I did donuts in the school parking lot. And yeah, when I handed it to my middle brother, they took it to discount tire. And the guy's like, dude, these things have like no treads left. (laughs) Now I don't do any of that. I I drive the speed limit. I have a Honda Accord. Like I don't want a standard transmission because I hated driving in traffic with stick shift, right? The funniest part is that like I'm cautious with my tires. Like I keep them maintained. I know how expensive they are now to replace. So I'm like, I don't really want to burn out brand new tires because I want these to last like two years or however long it lasts. Yeah. I didn't appreciate it back then because I didn't know how much it costs, how long it took to earn the money to pay for that. Right. And so you and your brother and, and everyone else listening to the podcast, like whoever's worked for things understands how much more they appreciate them, which is cool. Oh yeah. It means a lot more. Yeah. So what do you see for your book and for the growth of this product and business? Do you foresee like doing kind of like a book tour type thing or just speaking engagements and promoting? And I'm just curious because I know we're we're all about promotion. We have to go out and share our message to, you know, make sales and stuff. And so like, I want to grow my podcast. I want to grow, you know, my audience. And so what, what do you guys have in store for that? Do you have like a marketing plan in place or are you still kind of working through some of those details right now we're working on the big marketing plan. It's kind of fun for all of us because all the products, as you know, like secret entourage, watch Train Academy, ECH, they're all digital products. Yes. So this is kind of fun for us because it's our yeah, physical, our physical product. And even though there's, you know, the books like TCT and radius, 
they sort of sell themselves through the courses that, you know, are offered and, you know, they're like Amazon products. So it's a little bit more streamlined and simple where this is very like engaging towards the audience and something that we kind of have to work around a little bit to try and figure out the best way to get it in front of people. And also, you know, now that I'm involved, I have my own views and sites for this book and what I would like to do with it. And unfortunately, because of COVID, you know, we had some delays facts on things. I wanted to be able to go to car shows and events to promote this. I wanted to go to SEMA in November, which is like the biggest yeah. car in the world. And you know, it got canceled like a month ago and I was like, I felt my heart. Uh, inside. I was like, that. <laughs> yeah. But I, what I really want to see happen with this book is I want it in the hands of every single child. I don't care how old they are. I, I don't care if they're a boy, a girl. I don't care if you're a kid by age, kid at heart. I think this book belongs on bookshelves. Everyone and anyone that wants to teach their kids values and teach and give their kids something to strive for and work for. But I also want to do a lot of charity work with this book. We have a wonderful network here in South Florida of just people that want to, you know, reach out to kids that are in need. We have, you know, the Toys for Tots thing that happens around Christmas. There is a wonderful charity called Ride to Revive that gives, you know, very sick kids like a -a make-a-wish day out on racetracks with exotics and they take them for drives. And I want these kids to have this book because nonetheless, it makes you smile. And I think that is very important. And I just want people to hold it and smile and enjoy it and take it home and keep it forever and then give it to their kid and then give it to their kid. <laughs> so whatever it takes to make that happen, whether it's me writing 10,000 emails, going in front of millions of people and whatever way I can figure out, if it's me standing out in Times Square one day with a bullhorn being like, hey, look at this book. I'm <laughs> look at this it. book, yeah. I'm gonna I can't it. wait for that day where it's like, you know, people can be out in big groups and concerts and all those things festivals like all oh, it's just weird 2020 has been an interesting year I took it for granted i have to say for like the past 24 years of my I life i know <laughs> i'm like oh let's go to this <laughs> festival and that festival and like this concert and how about this and i mean just yeah even Times square being bumped into by thousands of people now it's like oh we know i've been in some places that are pretty crowded like i just got back from colorado and there were a lot of people out hiking and stuff but still people are kind of like oh you know let me go distance away from you it's a weird world yeah i'm like whoa a year ago this would have all been like that would never happen like that's insane and then now it's like okay oh i forgot my mask let me get my mask <laughs> to- the norm. like you know you gotta do like the phone wallet keys mask like all right, yeah just- that's a new thing i had to add to my um my routine of like you know my pocket taps where i'm like okay phone wallet keys <laughs> mask yeah that's the thing you always forget now so i know we all have to kind of pivot a little bit even I mean, me with real estate, I know open houses and everything kind of stopped for a little bit. And in some places, it's still like that. Mm-hmm. And people are doing virtual showings and I don't know, like doing the Matterport stuff where you can do like a 3D walkthrough of a house. Like you have to kind of adapt to whatever we're dealing with. Apartment during COVID. You did that? You toured an apartment virtually? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, moved in, I moved in about a month ago. I did not see one person during the entire process. That's so. kind of cool though, in a way, because it, I mean, a lot of the processes before were really clunky and inefficient. They can be, but I mean, I feel like something like, you know, buying a car, buying a house, renting an apartment, even though it's really good on camera and like the video, you kind of want to at least see it in person. I think sometimes most people, yeah. maybe for an apartment, it's a little easier than like, I don't know if anyone would really buy a house sight unseen, you know, without getting an inspection in person. But technology is cool. I mean, this is this is really changing things up. Like, I don't have to meet people in person anymore, really. They're kind of used to Zoom calls now. It's the new cool. norm. Like, doing business online now is so... It's so much more normalized. Yeah. I mean, even like Amazon, geez, just blowing up because people who resisted it and older people who never wanted to get online and buy stuff online, they're realizing like, oh, this is kind of awesome. Like, I don't have to go to... Macy's to buy a pair of shoes. Like I can just order it on Zappos or Amazon or one of those things. Exactly. Just the convenience of it all. But then it's also kind of scary. Cause like if the internet goes down one day, it's like, I feel myself starting to go like primitive. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Where am I, supposed <laughs> to go? I need to get to a coffee shop now. Like I gotta have internet. That's true. No, I know. Um, whenever the internet goes out, I'm kind of like, I need, like, that's the one thing I quote unquote need. I mean, yeah. AC heat, that's all good. But like, at least internet gives you entertainment. You can connect to Netflix if you're bored or 
that's always my biggest fear with stuff like a storm. The hurricane, luckily, fortunately, knock on wood, I mean, it missed us uh, in Houston and Galveston. But when storms have previously hit and the power goes out, you know, I'm the internet's Florida. gone. <laughs> yeah, y'all know that. Like oh, in yeah. Florida, that's hurricane yeah. season. That's yeah, that's the norm. So it's funny what a world we have. And it makes me wonder, like, how the heck did – cavemen do it you know what did they do all day they had no book well maybe they had like stick writing and drawings they just hunted and found food and then sang songs i guess like that would get so boring (laughs) (laughs) around the fire (laughs) yeah yeah i would get so bored it's insane to think about because now we have so much like entertainment on demand instant oh yeah instant dating entertainment yeah everything anything we could possibly want or need we that's can have so have true. Moments, including that's true. So. Yeah, that's so true. And then I think that kind of makes, that makes the physical product a little better and more desirable. And I've heard this before in like marketing classes and courses and stuff that an ebook is, it doesn't hold much value. If you give a free PDF away, like, okay, people might not read it because it's just like saved on their computer. But if you can ship them a free, like a book, you know, a free book plus shipping it feels more important because it's real. It has space on their desk or on their bookshelf and people value it more and it'll, it'll be there, right? Like if you send a gift in the mail to a client, that's actually useful. I mean, I have an example. Someone sent me this um, sticky note thing and I'm like kind of using it, you know, it's a checklist. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I need to, you know, book my annual checkup and like, okay, I got to go do my dentist appointment so I'm writing down stuff. I, I love those things. Like I, they're all over my apartment. I have like six of them somewhere. Yeah. It's so, I'm like, whoa, this is super helpful. And if you can do that with your clients or, you know, your customers, it's super impactful because like that thing's been on my desk for a month and I see her name on there. And anytime I have a client, she's like a partner of mine. And my clients also work with her in some cases, but I'm not tied to her. So I could send my clients to anybody, mm-hmm. but I think about her and I'm like, you know, maybe I'll send my client to her because she also will benefit. She's a lender and I'm in real estate. So yeah, it's just really cool to get yourself out there, you know, align yourself with other business owners and make relationships and connections like this because, you know, someone in the, in the audience may have a kid who really loves cars and they haven't had a good book about it. Right. And so now you're going to be able to fill that need for that kid or for the kids. We're all still human at the end of the day, as much as we're on digital and as much as we have like the cyber networks, we aren't cyborgs, we're humans. So physical touch and appearance and products and everything like that still matters. So my biggest thing was like, I, for example, for books, like I was one of those people that still to this day, I fight eBooks, I fight Kindles because if it's in a digital format, I'm not going to read it. So So I need it in paper, in my hand. I want to feel myself, turn the pages, have that validation that I'm getting through Bend the page, earmark the page, right? I won't do notifications or like calendar reminders like that on my phone. I put them on a planner so I can actually cross them off to get it done. And so, you know, that's, it's always been so important that we actually bring physical products to life because I know in a hundred, 200 years, everything's going to be holograms, (laughs) non-existent world that still exists somehow. And I think it's still super important like taking photos and actually printing them out and giving them to someone is such a that's cool right like it's a cool gift now before it was like oh cool a photo but now <laughs> like i gave my dad a photo of him and i from his wedding two years ago just as a christmas present and like it meant more to him than anything else i could have given him because it's like a physical reminder right that right existed so that's so true i mean with all of, like the fires and stuff going on in california colorado and all that I mean, I've seen a lot of people vacate the homes and like it stinks. And I was just thinking about this. Like, what if I had to evacuate my house and came back and it was all burned down and I'm getting really like lately, I've been reading all these books about spirituality and like, you know, minimalism and like possessions don't matter. You can always replace them. You have a whole other conversation about that. You're right up my alley. Yeah. Like I love stuff. Like it's on my vision board. I've got like the Lambo and all the cool stuff in the houses, but I'm like, as long as my family and I are safe and my pets and I are safe, like I can replace everything. And I was honestly thinking like the way I've built my life and I'm sure with um, most people listening to this podcast probably have done the similar thing. I don't have photo albums that I would miss and like sentimental stuff. Everything I need that's important is saved on Dropbox on Google drive, like my whole life memories. And I'm cautious about that. Like if I go on a trip and I take my camera, 
I instantly upload to Dropbox. So I'm like, if I lose the camera, if it gets stolen, I'm not like, I don't lose the memories from that trip. They're already saved in like five spots. Yep. And so, yeah, we could definitely have another conversation on that. But I mean, while things are cool, I think it's important to know that like with technology these days, I mean, in a good insurance plan, like anything you have can be replaced and you can create right with abundance you can create so much more than what you have right now. So I'm just in that place where I'm super excited to see like what's possible as we continue to, you know, uh, improve the world. Like those of us living right now, even if we're having a rough time, I mean, you see hobos with like phones, right? They've got, they got a cell phone. That's pretty good. (laughs) They can communicate, they can text. I mean, some of them still need help. You know, I would hate to live in a tent on the side of the road. I'm not downgrading that, but I mean, our quality of life has gone up so much compared to, you know, 100, 200 years ago, right? Like we're, we're living better than kings and queens did back in the day. They had fans. They had like slaves or whatever fanning them. We got AC, baby. <laughs> Can you imagine in the South Florida, like the heat without air condition? No, that's no. I went to the bank <laughs> today and the first thing they did when they opened the door, they were like, just so you're aware, AC's the AC out. is out. I was Ooh, like, and I was like, go to another bank. <laughs> I'm like, I only have to be here for 15 minutes, but God, 15 minutes in somewhere that doesn't have AC. Ooh. No, I'll just go to another one. And I literally right? just out of my way to another bank. That's the world we live in. It's awesome. I mean, there's pros and cons because that kind of goes back to what I was saying before. It's like good times create, you know, uh, weak people because yeah, if you have to sleep tomorrow. through the night without AC, oh, that's not fun. No, nope. first world <laughs> problem for sure. But for sure. But it's also your new normal, right? Like once you get to a certain level, and I know we're kind of deviating from like your marketing plan and stuff, but I think this is kind of interesting. But once you get to that new level, that's why it's so hard to go back. Like once you're used to something, it's hard to downgrade. Like if you're used to making a certain amount of money or maybe you're doing really well and then COVID hits, like I feel bad for so many of those business owners that their entire model, if there's movie theaters that are still closed right now, they're trying to figure out how to open but like I was thinking, I used to go to the movies a lot on the weekends and like now they're not even open. What yeah. what are they going to do? People are going to switch to on demand at home. And I kind of like watching movies at home better than going to a theater that has a stinky, you know, sticky seat, right? Yeah, there's, there's, popcorn. Popcorn. there's certain movies that you need to see in theaters and then there's ones that you can see at home. So like, yeah, well, like Endgame. I was like, no, nah, we got to go see that in, in person. Like, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. But yeah. other movies, I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's not so bad. And, you know, like most of them are like maybe like 10, 20 bucks on demand. And you think about yeah. it, you're like, well, I spent $12 for a ticket and then popcorn, so the popcorn and-, and everything else is like another like 12 bucks. So I'm like, it's technically cheaper to have a movie night at home. And it's yeah. a at home. I can do what I want. I have my blanket, my pillow, everything like that. So yeah. why not? Exactly. Especially if you have like a family of five or six or something. When you see people with a bunch of kids, I'm like, dang. You must have spent like 200 grand. <laughs> I saw, have you ever seen the meme where it's like checking out at the movies and it's like a crunch, a box of those crunch chocolates and a popcorn. It's like 98, 52, <laughs> that with a Coke. Like it's super pricey when you go out there. But I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how we got to this topic, but it was kind of funny just to talk about how <laughs> things are changing. 2020 has been an interesting year. Things are evolving. And so in a time when so many things are going digital, I think it's really cool that you're coming out with this physical product. And I personally also value physical books. Like I've got some behind me more than like, I don't have a Kindle. I don't think I would feel the same as convenient as it is to have a thousand books in a Kindle. I like having a bunch of books, right? My bookshelf. I like having them stacked. I like when people come in and they're like, ah, Oh, I've read that one too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, people say all the time, like, oh, I think I see, you know, four hour work week back there or whatever. I need a better bookshelf. This is really like a dresser behind me. But hey, it works right now. But yeah, I just want to get, you know, I guess Ty Lopez's bookshelf ad that inspired all of us to get bookshelves. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, oh, I got to step up my bookshelf game. 100%. Yeah, I was like, okay, that, that leads to getting those uh, Lambos and stuff. So I need to get more books. <laughs> Who's been one of the coolest people that you look up to that you've met from just your experience working with, you know, PJ, Secret Entourage, ECH? Have you met anyone who's like a superhero or like a a huge model to you that you really look up to? I I have to say PJ. I've met some incredible people through this journey. I've gotten to listen to some insane stories, but (laughs) watching him 
conquer everything he does and take on the weight of the world on his shoulders on projects that he goes through because he really is. I mean, we have a great a workhorse. Team. Yeah. He like, he slaves at it and he loves it and he feeds off of it. And he just, he wants things like if things are going like slow, like we're not even slow, things are going good. Like we finished a sale. We're good. We're great. He's like, all right, What's new next? Product, we're this, we're doing that, let's go look at it. And I'm like, all right, like, okay, sure. Why not? Cause he's just yeah. never say die, never quits, never <laughs> gets everything done as soon as it needs to get done. He is never the reason why a project can't move forward. If there's something that needs to be done on his end, it's done before I can even ask. So he is probably to this day, my biggest motivation and I want to be just like him when I grow up. Yeah. And that's so cool that you get to work closely with them as well, with him as well, because I've met some great people in my industry as well, but I mean, I don't really consider any of them like super where I want to be. I look at their lives and sometimes I'm like, it's great, but it's not that level of like fulfillment and mastery and where it looks like what you just said, you know, every goal that they touch is crushed and they're just always at, you know, working at the next thing. And so I'm, I'm kind of finding those mentors and aligning myself with them because I do want to get a closer relationship because you, you get to hang out with them. You probably break bread with him and like learn these little things as you catch up and talk. And just from watching like a fly on the wall at some of the things he's doing, that is something that you can't replace just from watching YouTube videos and, you know, trying to spend 10 minutes a week, you know, on someone's landing page, learning from whatever course that you bought. You got to be there in person. They're humans at the end of the day. And their little mannerisms that make us human are also the things that make us great or not so great, you know, business owners or things like that. And he's just every mannerism that he has, I have tried to adopt some things I can, some things I can't, but he's definitely my biggest motivation. And I'm very lucky that I get to work so close with him. And I'm also very lucky that he saw this book, listened to what I had to say and believed in it so much that he wanted to slap his company's name on it. So I'm that's very, super very cool. Impressed. And he loves cars too, obviously. I mean, I, I follow him on Instagram. I think his handles, I create millionaires, right. And he's got a bunch of nice cars. He He's a practitioner of ECH exotic car hacks. He's like, Oh, I traded this one in. I got this cool Ferrari. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> and Always. I have, hands always it's always, always swapping hands. hands yeah and watches too so watches cars all that and uh, it's it seems to be a hobby that a lot of successful entrepreneurs have of you know playing the watch game and then swapping and, and trading cars and and collecting cars right it becomes something that's more of a game as you get more successful i would imagine and if you're smart with your money it's you know it's also not just you know for fun there you make money on it too money. Yeah, they're diversifying their assets. And, you know, yeah. especially is something that I never understood. I was one of those people, I was like, Rolexes are cool, but it's the only brand I knew. And then when I started getting involved with like Watch Trading Academy, I was like, wait a second, like there's some serious money yeah. business and connections. So if you have the means, why not? Because even right. though you're playing with the smaller watches, know the big boys and the big boys aren't just important in the watch world, but in general. So even our community is so important because we have like 19 year olds that are flipping watches, you know, to help put themselves through college. (laughs) And then they're connecting with these like big boys and the big boys are like, you know, like I really admire your hustle. I admire your work ethic. Maybe I have a job for you. Like come exactly. That's so cool. That right there, everyone listening I, I used to go to car shows in high school because, I mean, I had the little V6 Mustang standard transmission. I wouldn't park it in the show and be like, parking on the side, right? <laughs> like rev it up and it's like about to blow a gasket or whatever. So I would park far, but I was always inspired by that. And I remember I met a guy who went to the same university as me and he was driving like a Porsche um, Spider. I forget the name, the Porsche Spider 9... I don't know, some kind of fancy thing. And I looked it up and it was not, again, I don't know a lot about cars. I'm just like, Ooh, that's shiny. And it looks cool. And my friend's like, dude, do you know how much that car is? And I was like, I don't know, like 150 grand. He's like, dude, that's, that's like 850 grand. It was 850 or 900,000 or something crazy. 918 spider. Most likely. The 918 spider. That's what it was. I, was like, I forgot the numbers. It was the 918 spider. And I was like, dude, that is not $900,000 car. Looked it up. Sure enough, it was. 
And then I got to talk to the owner and he had, you know, he had a company. I, I was always asking like, Hey, so what do you do? Like, how do you, how did you buy this? How do you afford this? Cause I was working in oil and gas or something, you know, making nowhere near what it would take to buy that car in like a hundred years of working. Right. Mm-hmm. So you get around those successful people. And like you said, they like your hustle. They kind of bring you under their wing and then maybe they offer you a job or a door opens for you and bam, you're learning from millionaires and billionaires that are in that game. People who have nice cars, they've got businesses. Most of them, I'd say most of those, if not all own some sort of business or they've created some kind of asset, right? The, probably the biggest thing I've seen that I think matters a lot, like when you're in these, you know, we talk about kids have formative years and then young adults do too. And yeah. I think it's really important from, I want to say like the age of about like 19 to 25, 26, it really matters who you surround yourself with because yes. if you're surrounding yourself with people that don't want to strive for more, that are okay, you know, doing what they're doing, then, you know, you're going to get there too. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in these years, when we're developing our skills, when we're at the prime of our lives, where we can go off of four hours of sleep and a shot of espresso, (laughs) why not surround yourself with these people that have worked so hard for 20, 30 years that know all these secrets, like we could get a jump on what took them 40 years to learn, we could learn in months. And yeah, why not? be around these people. Sure. It's intimidating at first. Sure. You're a little wary. You're like, I don't want to make this person think I'm this or that. Who cares? Put yourself out there because even if someone rejects you a hundred times, if all these millionaires and billionaires are like, listen, kid, you're nice, but you know, I'll talk to you later. There's going to be one guy that that's going to yes. you know what? let's have a cup of coffee. And you're going to learn more from that one guy than you so would have true. ever learned from s- sitting with your high school friends and talking about the good times. Like good times are great to remember, but we need to make better times. And that's what, you know, stepping up looks like. And that's what people got to do in our young years because we're not going to be this young forever. Exactly. And I mean, the the saying that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second ble- best time is today. Like just because you may not have started a goal, you know, people listening right now, if you haven't started that thing that you've been wanting to do, or you're not as far as you wanted to be, it's not like it's too late. I mean, the KFC dude, I forget his name. Um, he became a millionaire or successful when he was in his sixties, uh, Colonel Sanders. Right. And so I hope I don't, you know, I hope it's not until when I'm sixties. Cause I'm like, man, that's kind of a long time from now. But at the same time, I'm like, it's possible, you know, as long as you're getting better than you were yesterday, you're making progress and I would call it a win. But of course, like you said, if you can get a jump on what others took 30 years to learn, you can learn in a couple of months or a year of just closely shadowing them and learning the work ethic and the trade. That's invaluable. Mm-hmm. That's super, super helpful information. So I know we're kind of nearing the end of the hour here and I actually do have a, another call right after this. So, uh, and I also want to be res- respectful of your time but did you have any takeaways that you wanted to leave the audience with? I know we talked about a lot of good stuff from popcorn at movies to like <laughs> to cars. We kind of went in a random direction there too. But um, what would be one of your main takeaways for our audience on pursuing their dream and like making something like taking your idea from your head into reality? Like any takeaway that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, guys, put it down on paper. Like we've been talking a lot Bam. about people manifestation and everything like that, like bringing an idea to life. And the first way you do that is put it on paper. Yeah. Google sheets are cool. Slides are even better. I love docs. I I get it guys. (laughs) The moment you put something down on a sheet of paper, whether it's a goal or a sketch for an idea, it becomes real. And that's when you see it with your own eyes and you're like, you know what? This can happen because I thought it out. So now let's figure out, how to bring it to life. And it's not easy. There have been so many hiccups along the way for so many people, not even just me listening to other people that have brought products to life. Everyone seems to have a stalemate or something, but where there's a will, there's a way. And if you can hold yourself accountable to find that way, then you're going to get through and you're going to love seeing what you're at at the end of it all. Like it's just going to feel 10 times better because then you get to say, I made it through this. I got to go through this. And then, you know, if you didn't throw it away, you get to look at that piece of paper and you're like, my idea is now this. That's so cool. And like you said, I mean, I was always the biggest proponent for that Google Sheets and technology and I use Google Calendar and I'm all about like, hey, I don't want to, even phone calls, I'm like, I don't want to call people. I want them to email me, text me, all automated. But like you said, the human component, conversations in person, you can't always replace that. 
and the same goes for writing it down. And so I've, you know, I write my goals down and when you write it down, you make it real and you can't free draw, you know, you can't like draw a process so easily on Google sheets. You can only type. So you're kind of constricted in a way, right? So that is huge. And I love what you just said there to write it down. It becomes real. And then you can see how you've taken your idea onto paper and then into implementation mode. Awesome. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. Where can our audience go to learn more about you, to follow you, to uh, check out your your book and get on the waiting list or pre-order? Yeah, uh, right now. I mean, hopefully when this comes out, we'll be doing pre-order, but you guys can follow me. Uh, I'm at uh, Instagram. It's Rach, R-A-C-H dot Alfonso, A-L-F-O-N-S-O. And then uh, my book is at What Cars Say Book. And then the website itself to get on the wait list to pre-order whatever it is in the time that you're listening is www.whatcarsay.com. Awesome. And I will link all of that up in the show notes and I'll make sure to um, promote you as best I can, you know? So thank you so much and best of luck on the launch. I know you guys are going to kill it and you've got, you've got quite the team behind you supporting you as well. So I know this is going to be successful and it's going to be crazy whenever I go see like a friend's kid. I'm like, I remember interviewing the person who came up with this book and that book is on the shelf. I love it. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me on. This is amazing. This is my first podcast ever. So always Congrats. in my heart. <laughs> yeah, no. And, I, and you did a really good job. Like just the way you spoke, you're very well spoken. I mean, you have wisdom beyond your years, right? I was working a corporate role in your, at your age. I mean, I just turned 30, even though I don't look it, but not at all. It took me a while to kind of get on that level of thinking. And so I think you're on an awesome path. And of course, everyone's journey is different. So it's not like I'm behind or anything. I feel behind sometimes. But then well, again, other people, I've, I've met people who are like 60 and then they meet me and they're like, man, I wish I thought like you at your age, we're just starting to get into real estate or whatever. So don't compare yourself to others. But yeah, good job. And uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. Yes, let's do it. Thank you so much again. Yes, thank you.